welcome to this fringe event as part of Congress 2021. I'm Claire Coatman, I'm the TUC's senior campaigner. I'm delighted to be chairing the panel discussion this evening. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce Eve Livingston, who is our keynote speaker for the panel, if you like. She is the journalist and author of Make Bosses Pay. And I had a really enjoyable conversation with Eve at the start of last year as she was doing the research for her book. So it's been really wonderful for me to see the results. It's the latest book in Pluto Press's Outspoken series, and it's out on the 20th of September, just a week to go. So now's a great opportunity to get a preview of Eve's um, work and the arguments that she's making. Eve asks, with the world changing at breakneck speed and workers, particularly younger workers, at the whim of apps, bad bosses and zero hours contracts, why should we care about unions? What is their relevance in the 21st century? She explores how young workers are organising to demand fair workplaces and she reimagines what an inclusive union movement that represents us all might look like and how our unions might change to work better for the next generation at work. Over to you Eve. Thank you very much Claire and thank you everyone for, for joining this session and particularly to the other panellists I feel really um, honoured to be alongside so many of these people that have shaped um, a lot of the ideas and, and uh, some people who are actually featured in the book as well which is exciting. So yeah by way of background and I've got the book here it's just arrived so that's quite exciting first glimpse but by way of background as Claire said the book is one of um, a series called Outspoken by Pluto Press and the kind of background to that series series is that these are books for um, a young audience, 18 to 25 year old roughly, um, talking about different sorts of political themes to, to that audience kind of in particular. And so when Pluto approached me um, and asked me if I would write a book for the series, they didn't specify what that should be about. They asked me if I had any ideas. Um, and as soon as I started speaking to them and to the editor there, um, of the series and she explained the rationale for the series was about young people being able to put their energy into something, about inequalities, about tackling tackling unfairness, injustice and, and building a, a better society. And so it was a no-brainer for me at that point that the book had to be about unions because I've come to realise in, in my kind of journalism about workplaces and about unions and about social justice um, more broadly that unions in their kind of widest sense, so collectives of various different kinds, um, are the best vehicle that um, ordinary people have for taking control over their own lives, not just in the workplace, but building, as I say, a better society. So that, that's why the that's how the book came about. And it speaks both to um, young workers about why they should be in unions, why unions are vital, but it also speaks to the kind of union movement about what it could be doing um, differently and in some cases better to work for these young workers that we're asking to, to join us. So there's tons of stuff in the book. I won't be able to cover it all today, um, but I did want to focus on on three things in a sort of um, chronological order, if you like. I wanted to focus um, firstly on how we kind of situate unions in the public conversation and um, how we reach young workers and and then crucially how we retain them because that will be the, the future of the, the movement. So I think the, the first thing to say that's really important for me is that young people are not hostile to unions and they're not this kind of abstract unreachable group and they're not unwilling to do the work um, or uninterested in what unions have to say. Um, there is clearly a dissatisfaction that young people have um, about work and about life in general, actually. Young people can see that the society we live in is unfair and unfairly structured. Um, and we know that because we've seen youth climate strikes and we've seen booming numbers in tenants unions and community unions, even if we haven't necessarily always seen that in trade unions. Um, and we've also seen best-selling books about workplace productivity and work-life balance. And we've even seen what I call in the book workfluencers, so kind of Instagram influencers moving into the space of workplace coaching and career um, guidance and goal setting and that kind of thing. So the problem isn't, as I say, that young people aren't interested or that they don't want to do the, the hard work. The problem is that when they look for an answer, 
currently it's not always unions that are there um, meeting them when they're trying to find a place to put that energy. And so that's partly a kind of branding exercise. But as I talk about in the book, it's crucially a sort of challenge for organisational strategy um, and industrial strategy and political education and consciousness raising. So in terms of how we actually reach those young workers, one of the, the key things that I talk about in the book, which won't be new to anyone in this session, is that obviously we've seen this dramatic change in um, the type of economy that we uh, live and work in. So unions were built for a very different economy than the one that young workers today occupy. They're not in kind of um, manual labour jobs on the whole, some of them are, but lots of them are in retail, hospitality, uh, care and personal services. And that's quite a I think for the union movement that's not necessarily in the workplaces or the sectors um, that young people are in. So that that is a, a big challenge for the movement, I think, is asking a lot of a movement that's used to servicing its fee-paying members for very good reason um, to take a big risk and invest kind of resources and time and energy in whole new sectors um, and whole new workforces. But certainly the kind of argument that I make in the book is that that is an investment that would pay off um, tenfold and more. Um, and I think embracing that sort of boldness and risk taking in other ways is going to be really important too for the future of the movement. So being able to be responsive and fast acting has been harder in some of the kind of bigger unions with, you know, lots of different layers of um, bureaucracy or democracy, depending on how you look at it. And uh, so, so being able to um, act quickly when young people come to you with a grievance and being able to respond and not necessarily just having to wait three months or whatever for somebody to meet the threshold to be offered guidance I think will be important and I also think that for many young workers in terms of reaching them in the first place some of the things that they are concerned about go far beyond the workplace when you talk to young people today a lot of the things that they'll mention first of foremost are to do with the climate or to do with the housing crisis and not necessarily to do with work and so I think that there's a big job for unions to do in terms of joining those dots being active on those issues and building alliances with the, the, those movements and um, which I think will be to, to everyone's benefit and then I think really crucially something that we maybe don't talk about as much when we're talking about kind of membership numbers and recruitment is what we then do um, when we boost those numbers so how we retain those young workers once they've arrived and I think that is sometimes made more difficult by the type of model that a lot of unions have been forced to adopt in terms of a service model there's really good reasons why why unions have gone in that direction to do with the really difficult circumstances that they're operating in and the kind of clampdowns that have happened on a lot of their um, activities but I think from speaking to young workers in the book and for, from speaking to organisers who have worked specifically with young workers, um, crucially it is visible wins and it is bold, deep organising that recruits those young workers and that keeps them involved. So rather than the sort of um, ad hoc firefighting that we can sometimes see where unions are um, winning on individual grievances, very importantly, I think some of the really successful bits of the union movement when it comes to young workers have done is to survive those issues straight off the bat. So someone arrives with a grievance, the issue is collectivised and it's put into a political context where that young worker who may never have thought really about kind of capitalism or, or kind of political awareness gets to realise that it's not a, a one-off issue. It's not that they've got a bad apple boss. It's not that there's something wrong with them. It's that this is a feature of work and not a bug. Um, and that the only way to take that on is is collectively and as part of a, a sort of bold political movement, which is where unions, I think, need to be situating them. And in some cases, that will also, I think, require a rethink of um, democratic structures um, that really allow for kind of new members to come in and, and make their voices heard and valued rather than there being a sort of top down um, hierarchy, as we do see in some corners of the movement still. Um, so that's a broad brush um, look at some of the, the big arguments that I have in terms of the movement as a whole and, and how it might um, how it might become more attractive to young workers. And I think it's really important to say that, that these things aren't that bold or radical or out there. There's lots of bits of the, the union movement and there's lots of speakers on the panel today who will um, talk about how they're doing exactly this kind of work already. And so, yeah, I'm not asking for something um, huge or radical. I think it is the direction that a lot of people are already starting to go in. But certainly the kind of message, I suppose, that I would um, leave you with is that the young people I've spoken to 
while they do care about things like a sort of nice um, website or discounts or things like that, and, and none of those things are bad things, they're all really good things to be offering young workers. But what they care about the most or what kind of switches them on the most is, as I say, these visible wins, this sort of political consciousness raising education um, and deep organising that really builds power rather than just firefighting, as I said. Yeah, that, that's I suppose, what I would leave you with, but I'm really interested to hear what the, the rest of the panel um, have to say and um, to take your questions afterwards as well. Thanks so much, Eve. A really fabulous overview of your really interesting book and some really important challenge there for the movement. And I think you've put the challenge in a very helpful way. It feels like there's a lot there that we can really engage seriously with. And that it's just so crucial that we do. Young workers really need unions and unions really need young workers. And so I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker who will be the first to respond to some of the ideas that Eve is bringing. Shivana Taj is the General Secretary of the Wales TUC. She previously worked for PCS and she's leading on organising black workers for the TUC's anti-racism task force. Over to you, Shivana. Thanks. So firstly, a big congratulations, Eve, on the publication of your book. It's really powerful and it's definitely effectively constructed the arguments for the importance of trade unions. I love that it's a, a short read and that it actually jumps straight into the big challenges that we're facing, including how sometimes we can come across as characterised as that small-c conservatism and extremely excessively sometimes cautious, rule-book heavy, and all about the committees and somewhat inward-looking. It really does somewhat limit us in terms of our appeal, particularly to younger workers. As Eve sets out clearly in the chapter on the challenges of organising and gig economy workers, if we are to successfully evolve and grow our membership, then we need to have a frank conversation about our risk appetite as well in our organising and be willing to incorporate uh, many of the lessons that we're now seeing coming out of lots of different campaigns, including Better Than Zero in Scotland. Wales TUC's research throughout the pandemic has reinforced lots of the points that Eve has made around the unique challenges, uh, specifically um, in relation to young workers and, and what they're facing, for example. We worked with YouGov to poll workers on their health and safety concerns on a, on a monthly basis throughout the second wave last winter. And our findings were consistent. The young workers were much less likely to feel able to raise their concerns and much less likely to see their problem resolve when they actually raised it. I'd also um, I'd like to flag up the importance of chapter four in the book as well, which makes the case for a liberatory uh, unionism. And uh, there's a specific emphasis on intersectionality um, here. Ultimately, workers are not a, uh, one homogenous group with identical experiences. We all need to check ourselves, actually, and not wallow so much sometimes in nostalgia for the victories and the battles of our past as well, as tempting as that can be, because I think that there are so many current battles and wins that we should be celebrating from the here and now and talking about them, where we've used strategic leveraging tactics that have seen us fight off bad practices like fire and rehire. We've won living wage campaigns. We've been working with tenant unions, unionizing groups of workers who were sometimes quite often seen as too difficult um, in hospitality and, and organizing, you know, in trades such as taxi drivers as well. I apologize, that is my neighbor's dog. My window is shut, but it's uh, it, it's having a special moment, I think. I'm hopeful as well that the TUC's anti-racism task force, which I'm a part of, is going to help us shift the dial on some of this as well. I wanted to just quickly mention a couple of things in terms of what we're doing here is in Wales. As, as the General Secretary of the Wales TUC, you are not going to be surprised to hear that my idea for change comes out of the specifics of the Welsh context. But there is potential for its, I, I would say, the application beyond. So the book he highlights the extent to which UK legislation and policy has disempowered and undermined unions over the last four years. And the knock-on effect of the disempowerment is that unions can be seen as perceived as weak and ineffective. But the picture is much more nuanced than a UK level analysis allows. And my argument is that there is now some real opportunity through working with devolved national and regional governments to change this picture and empower workers. In, in Wales, our agenda has is very much uh, focused around social partnership structures established by the Welsh Government, which gives workers direct input into policy decisions. We've got some, uh, we've got social partnership and procurement legislation, and we've got the commitment in relation to the findings of the Fair Work Commission as well and the newly established Social Care Forum, um, which 
we are going to be using to to move forward around practical steps to drive up pain conditions in the sector as well. And I think that there's also some good examples of ambitious. We've got the Labour mayors in the northwest of England as well. They're going to be they've got some interesting things that they're doing. And in Wales, we're about to launch a commission looking at the next steps for the Wales TUC, that is, and looking at the next steps for employment rights and devolution of Wales. So I think that as far as the picture is concerned, my argument would be that even within a dismal kind of UK picture, there are ways that unions can work creatively with those more sympathetic, uh, socialist leaning governments to address many of the issues that Eve has highlighted in the book. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Shav. A really great reminder there of the creativity that we can tap into when we take a more granular approach and whether that's looking at different regions and nations of the UK or remembering that young workers are themselves very far from a homogenous group. Our next speaker, Jana Mills, helped co-found the excellent digital agency Small Axe, which I have been a fan of. They run campaigns for social sector organisations, and that includes the groundbreaking work um, that they did for the NEU School Cuts campaign in 2017. Over to you. Jana. Thank you. And yeah, great. It sounds really exciting to read this book and when it comes out on the 20th Eve, it sounds brilliant. And, uh, and yeah, so many great examples from people who who are about to speak as well. I can see some really great unions who've been doing loads of stuff on this already. I think I just wanted to focus on one really simple experience that I have had as a young person who's joined. I don't know if I'm young anymore, but I was young maybe when I joined a union and from others that I've spoken to, which was just joining. The first thing you do, you go through the process, you do it all online and then that's basically it. The first thing you get is like an insurance. Do you want to buy insurance? as an add-on and then really no one gets in touch with you one kind of there's no sense that you're part of the movement or you're part of anything really meaningful no one's sort of checking to see okay you've joined do you want to organize your workplace and I know all this stuff is super expensive and could we really do it across everything but equally if we're gonna if we're talking about investment and what could we do with a blank checkbook and how could we organize at scale that feels because there are people joining that through all the stuff that's happened through COVID tens of thousands of people have joined people have joined um, trade unions over the last sort of 18 months and I think just having that process in place where it doesn't even have to be with an organizer it could be with members I'd do that a couple of times a month meet up with a new member of my trade union whether they're in my branch or not and just say okay this is what it means this is what it's about nice to meet you we go for drinks on a Friday at X time or whatever and just having that kind of personal induction I think it, it, out of that can come a load of great stuff in terms of what does that person have to offer what do they want to get out why do they join all these sorts of things and I think a lot of people, to be honest, maybe whether they're young or not, they just want to feel like they're part of something and that they're valued and needed in the union. I think a lot of the other stuff that's been said comes back down to that, that they want to do something meaningful and they want to feel like their, their participation is necessary to win. Like it's a necessary part of the strategy rather than I think sometimes it can feel a bit like to people because sometimes maybe it is true sometimes that the way we organize stuff, people's participation isn't seen as the most important thing or, or the thing that's going to help us win. Do you know what I mean? And I think the more we go into every battle with that mindset, people will also, so I think I'll finish early. Thanks, Jana. Yeah, I really like some of the points you're making there. I really agree with the power of personal conversations and you're right it doesn't have to be a paid organizer it can absolutely be other members and what you're touching on I think is really important about the psychology of how we're engaging younger workers when you say they want to feel necessary for they're needed for the win I really hear that I'd now like to welcome Brian Simpson, who is a leading organiser for Unite's hospitality sector in Scotland, where he's also worked with Better Than Zero's high profile campaigns, which I've got personal inspiration from. Brian. Thanks, Claire. Um, I want to also reflect or echo what Shav said in terms of congratulations on this book. I remember meeting Eve maybe two and a bit years ago in a cafe in Glasgow. And she was pitching this idea about this book and Pluto had contacted her about it and I just thought it was an amazing idea and I think we spoke for about three hours. I think we'd booked out about an hour and we ended up talking for at least two and a half about what this book could be about but also the excitement of what it could start. So I'm just tremendously personally and, and uh, politically professionally proud of Eve and, and the book and for that I would expect a signed copy, please, that I shall pay for, but I would expect it to be signed, hopefully, sister. Um, but yeah, just, I've only got three minutes, so just 
moving into the kind of crux of the issue, which is around hospitality, as Claire says, I organise workers across Scotland in bars, restaurants, hotels, cafes, casinos. And it really is impossible to exaggerate just how cataclysmic the pandemic's been for the sector and, and more importantly for the workers who drive it. A toxic combination of delayed and inadequate government support combined with the actions of unscrupulous employers has cost hundreds of thousands of jobs within the sector. Accord, according to Forth, which is the most used employee data software in the industry, the hospitality workforce shrunk by 26% in 2020 compared to 2019. That would equate to 650,000 job losses across the UK. Uh, that would eclipse anything that's ever happened in the industry. And a large proportion of those jobs have been from multinational corporations like the Intercontinental Hotel Group, who absolutely could have used the furlough scheme to retain workers through the pandemic, but they chose not to, opting instead to lay off thousands of workers and then bring them back on reduced terms and conditions and then using public money to pay the severance packages of the workers in the process. But as horrendous as the last 18 months have been for hospitality, it's in this sector that I think we can see the most obvious and tangible impact of unions, as Eve talks about in Organising for Power. What you've got is the lowest paid, the most precarious workers, who also happen to be the youngest, the most diverse workforce in the UK economy, coming together, many for the first time, and fighting back um, fighting against that mass fire and rehire and forcing some of the biggest employers in the country to think again. I don't want to show off, um, but there's quite a lot of examples in the last 18 months of this in hospitality and what we've been doing with Unite Hospitality. I've only got three minutes and actually a minute and a half. Uh, I've pulled out three of my favourite examples. So when the world's largest hotel chain, the Marriott Group, they refused to furlough 1,500 casual workers, a workforce of majority young women, migrant workers. They came together, they clubbed together and demanded fair and equitable treatment with their permanent counterparts. And they won reinstatement and they won 80% wages backdated till March 2020. When Scotland's largest hospitality employer, the G1 Group, sacked almost 2,000 workers by phone. Members immediately got to work organising their colleagues. They launched a national social and mainstream media strategy which aimed at battering the reputation of this infamous employer. And within 48 hours, the company was forced into an embarrassing U-turn and they reinstated all 2,000 workers. When Scotland's largest hospitality workplace, the Scottish Events Campus, eh, tried to terminate 630 workers via Facebook. At the start of the pandemic, our members got to work. I'm going to be honest and say we only had um, about 30, 40 members at the beginning. They got to work and organised their colleagues with a collective grievance, a public media campaign that forced Compass, the world's largest hospitality employer, not only to reinstate the workers on 100% pay, but also to pay them between £9.30 an hour and £12.30 an hour per hour. The Louisa Jordan, which was the venue which eventually became the makeshift hospital and vaccination centre. But even more than that, as a direct consequence of that win, Compass have just agreed a range of new policies which shall apply across every venue in the UK, including the XL Centre, Wimbledon, Twickenham, which will mean that every worker, and this is 60,000 workers, will receive the real living wage, regardless of age. They're going to implement a proactive sexual harassment policy and offer minimum hour contracts across all 70 venues. And where is this going to be rolled out first? The Scottish Events Campus, where this all started. So from a small group of Unite members taking action to stop their unnecessary redundancy back in April 2020, their actions will now positively affect as many as 60,000 workers across the UK. Examples like this is what Eve's book is all about and why its circulation is so important. How unions, not as bureaucracies or institutions, but as the collective voice and power of workers in struggle, continue to be the, the, the greatest vo uh, force, as Eve says, for progressive and transformative change within society. Covid may have decimated our industry, but it's also shown the real power of new workers in struggle. As a movement, my pitch, that as a movement, we cannot afford to squander the opportunity, not only to build workers' power within that industry, which has been hitherto untouched by unions, but to radically transform our economy for the benefit of workers who actually make the profit of these companies. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, another really inspiring contribution, and I think really helpful for all of us to hear those two sides of it, the really gruelling details of the experiences of some younger workers 
particularly in precarious employment, but then what's happening when they fight back in the Marriott and Scottish events campus at Compass. Yeah, I love hearing the two sides of that together. Our next speaker is Sarah Jaffe, who is a journalist. She's written extensively about unions in the UK and the US. She's author of the books, Work Won't Love You and Necessary Trouble. And I'm really looking forward to hearing her perspective on Make Bosses Pay. Hi everyone. I'm really happy to be here because as was just said, I am a labor journalist, which was a very lonely specialization to get into for quite a while. I was one of two or three people trying to hammer out the beat once again, as you can tell from my accent, I'm American. And there were a couple of people, basically Barbara Ehrenreich and Liza Featherstone, that I looked up to when I started trying to be a labor journalist something like 13 years ago now. And it was a thankless job for quite a while. So I'm always really excited to find new people who are getting into it, fighting to make space for it. It often seems like it's even more thankless a job in the UK than the US, despite you all having twice the union density that we do per capita. I was really excited to have Eve's book. I basically barraged her with messages being like, I'm blurbing your book. And the book is great. I, it's legitimately great. It's an argument for a vital, engaged, radical, class-conscious fighting labor movement, in Eve's words, a liberatory unionism, which I think is so necessary right now because I don't know if everybody's noticed, but the planet is on fire and <laughs> nothing is getting better unless we fight for it. I'm going to use the last minute and 20 seconds as on my timer to make a case for labor journalism and to make a case since I have a union audience here that unions should support it more because I, at the beginning of this, we talked about whether we had pitches and it turns out I have a pitch, which is that we need about 20 more Eve Livingstons. And that isn't going to happen with billionaires funding the press. It's going to happen, I guess, if working people actually get behind it. One of the things that's been really interesting in the States in recent years is that one of the growth sectors for unions has been digital journalism. In fact, we're having big fights within two of the unions that have been organizing them recently about whether they've been too successful in organizing digital journalism. But what's happened because of that is actually a sort of virtuous cycle of better labor coverage because the journalists have been through labor struggles in their workplaces. And so I think one of the things that is worth considering in terms of getting young workers into unions is how they're covered and how they're discussed in the press and whether that's actually given space and time and value and whether unions are, are doing what they can to make sure that labor journalism exists. And I will stop there because my alarm just went off. Thank you so much, Sarah. An excellent pitch for labour journalism. And that's so interesting about how journal the journalism itself is changing as the experiences of the journalists come up against some of these workplace challenges. I think it's so important that we have the right exposure to what's really going on, what are the actual conditions people working in, and then also that we get to hear about the inspirational stories of workers coming together, and then also that we have the kind of bigger spaces to think and reflect about these big movement dynamics can make bosses pay. Our final speaker is Sarah Woolley. Sarah is the General Secretary of the BFAWU. She's responsible for their work organising low paid workers in McDonald's, might have heard of that campaign, Greg's and other workplaces across the food industry. Over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Claire. And I want to start by saying I'm really excited about this book and the, the potential that this one and the series in general will have on young people and introducing them to the trade union movement and political education. It just it really excites me. So, you know, kudos to you, Eve, for, for putting that together. It, it puts a fire in your belly that there's potential. My kind of pitch, if you want to call it that, is that I think we need to talk to young workers more, not go straight in for the pay us X amount a week or a month and we'll support you at work. We need to listen to them. We need to learn from them and we need to be guided by their needs. As trade unions, we often find ourselves deciding that we know what workers' issues are. We've been there, we've done that. And as an aging movement, that can mean sometimes we're presuming things that aren't a reality for young workers. 
I'm thinking about the, the good old, we offer a free will amongst other things. And as and I think it's already been mentioned about insurance offers. We learned a lot from the McStrikers and members at Weatherspoons. They, they didn't know how they could improve their workplaces. We, we could support them with that, but we needed to build up their trust that we could. And they were the ones that knew what their issues with hours and pay and managers and the impact out of outside of work as well as inside and so on were not us because it wasn't happening to us on a daily basis. And as unions, we can go all in all guns blazing, telling them how bad their employer is. But sometimes that's not their interpretation of it, which in turn can put young workers off joining because they, they probably don't know what a trade union is. They don't necessarily trust us and they may not feel confident enough to go head to head with their the, what could be their first ever employer, relying on this strange body that they're not really sure about, but they know it's costing them money to be in. I don't believe that they can change anything, so just leave and go on to another job in this never-ending cycle. And don't necessarily see that they're being exploited because it's the first experience of work, and that's what work is, isn't it? Being shouted at by your manager for not getting an order right straight away with minimal training or not even being given a shift all week because you asked for a day off or, or even dared to ask for a break. We've got to listen to young workers, ask them if they think things like having no break is right and how they would make changes at work if they could, and then empower them so that they know that along with their work colleagues, they can make the changes for the better, whether that be getting a toaster in the canteen area, removing a bullying boss or securing a pay rise, and know that the wide trade, wider trade union will be there to support them doing it, give them direction when they need it, and absolutely stand in solidarity with them but be clear with them that they are the trade union and collectively they have the power to make the change, not me as an individual with a title, them as the membership. I could go on, but so to summarise, talking to young people and learning from them, empowering them to act collectively is key, I think, because however long we've been in the movement and however much experience we have, there's still a lot of learning to do. Thank you so much, Sarah. Another really important contribution there. Yeah, I think you're completely right. I think if we're not building trust with young workers, respecting their experiences actually as they experience them and then empowering them, then we're just repeating the problematic behaviour of the bosses. So I'm going to move on to our Q&A section after all of that food for thought. I'm going to start with a question to sharpen our thinking a bit as we look at the union movement. So I'm going to ask if you could change one thing about the union movement, what would it be? I can see Eve with a wry smile. So I'm going to go to Eve for her one change. Um, I think my wry smile was like, wow, that's such a big question. I'm not sure of the answer. Um, but I suppose, and it's a bit of a cop-out answer, but I suppose one of the things I came to realise when I was um, doing the research for the book was that I originally hadn't planned to have a whole chapter about union democracy. I'd kind of planned to like mention democratic structures where they were relevant um, at different points in the book. And as I did the as I did the research, I came to realise that like the democratic structures in in different bits of the union movement are key to a lot of this. I think we start to see a lot of the kind of problems that we can identify with the union movement in terms of maybe a lack of diversity, even like hierarchical movement, which kind of as you just said, Claire, replicates actually our workplaces <laughs> rather than something that we've built for ourselves. So I think that's the cop-out answer because it's really big. But I think if I could change one thing, it would be to, to radically restructure the sort of democracy of some bits of the, the union movement and make them much more grassroots up rather than top down. Thank you. Shav, from an insider's perspective, what do you change? I'd probably something similar to what Eve's just said. The fact of the matter is that trade unions are historically made a certain way, but that doesn't mean that we can't change things. We've, under my, as I came into this role not long ago, we've already started to actually look at our rule book and including our executive that say it, half of this stuff doesn't even make any sense. So we are actually looking at our rule book and saying, can we just make it really easy to understand? And are there any particular gaps in there that we could change? So for me, there are lots of things that we do where we point the finger at employers and say that they need to do better. But I think that there's stuff that we can do as well, including applying things like positive action to actually change the way that our structures look and feel like as well. Because it goes back to that point about workers are not a homogenous group equally, reps and activists are not one homogenous group. So how are we going to do that? I think we've got to go beyond the nice sayings 
We need to just go with it and go, this is boom, this is what we're going to do. We may not be able to do it everywhere, but where is it that we can embed it quickly? And then that becomes the norm and everyone just goes, yeah, that's the way that we're going to do it from now onwards. And, and making ourselves much more accessible and removing barriers, I would say, to accessing unions. So, for example, during COVID, we worked with, we knew, for example, the BME workers were being disproportionately impacted in the workplace, but also for a range of different issues. So we worked with a third sector organization that got some funding. They set, they set up a helpline and every single one of our affiliates agreed that regardless of how long um, somebody was a member of the union for or whether or not they were a member of the union, anything in relation to employment would automatically come to us. And we would then pass it on to the specific appropriate union. And the unions have benefited because they've managed to recruit off the back of that. They've, you know, identified new activists. They've got into particular workplaces where they never had access before. So they really benefited by just like a really easy thing for us to do. So sometimes I think it's just about applying that flex and trialing different things out. Thank you. And Jana, I feel like Small Axe is often called on to um, help support the TC and unions with areas where we're um, not as strong internally ourselves yet. How can we be better clients? How can we be better positioned to get the help that we need? That is a good uh, spin on the question. I think to be honest with you though, I, I actually think lots of the things that have already been said kind of actually do answer that question a bit. Like I think one thing that I think would hit for us, which would help us do our work better and I suppose help members as well would be thinking about how we can be more open with our strategy. I think there's, there's a maybe sometimes too much of a culture of trying to like, the strategy happens in the background and then we try and really like oversimplify everything because we think people don't want to hear it. And I think actually just being much more open and transparent with people about the fact what it is that we're trying to do in our sector, which I think Sarah really outlined. Like if I was a, if I was a, someone working in one of those shops, I would have exactly, I would know from her, hearing her speak, what her vision was for unionizing it, taking industrial action, and how it could be a part of it. And I think just if you have that clarity for members, you also, or prospective members, you also have it sort of almost instinctively for staff, for people who are supporting you as well. And I think that way then people, everyone, including members, including official staff, everyone who's involved can then get on and, and just have good ideas and do interesting stuff because we all know what we're doing and it's an open playbook. Do you know what I mean? So I think probably just trying to be more open in the way we're going about trying to change things. Thank you. We've had two questions about anti-union laws and anti-strike laws and about how some of the things that Eve is advocating to be quick and responsive, to use digital, that can be really hindered by the legal framework that we're operating in. And of course, that is deliberate. <laughs> Um, the legal framework has been put there to hinder us. That's not a uh, too political thing to say. And so to the panel, what is your response to that as a dynamic in all of this? As we're trying to be better organisers, as we're trying to reach younger workers, we still have to operate within this legal system. Brian. Yeah, thanks, Claire. I think you've already started my answer. The legal system is built. Um, is manned, and that literally mostly manned, um, by people who are anti-worker by their very definition. Any law that has any statute, any case law that's that's out there which is progressive, which is which is taking the side of workers, has been won by the collective force of workers. I don't think there's any exceptions to that. So I would go further than what you've said and to say that law, as there are past examples are of the women's strike in, in Dagenham in 1968, forced the Equal Pay Act, it forced the hand of a Labour government in the Equal Pay Act. Plenty of other examples historically, but I think we should bring that right up to date for young workers. I'm probably going to get any trouble for saying this, but United Hospitality doesn't frankly care about the anti-union laws that exist because we can't, we simply can't, we can't be scared to name and shame employers through absolutely draconian defamation legislation to name and shame employers. We'll obviously make sure it's evidenced because we've got hundreds of workers corroborating what we're saying. But that's how we get wins. That's how we force the hand of employers where we don't have huge union membership, is we name and shame them. Because ultimately that's what these employers care about, is, is their reputation and their profits. So if we can affect them, the, both of those things, whilst also building confidence and power, 
within that particular workplace, then that's the strategy and tactics which is working. That's how we've built four and a half thousand new members in the last three years in Scotland alone. So that is the tried and tested method. And I'm probably going to get any trouble, but not by the new boss and Unite perhaps, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. And we've had a clarification as well to tighten up my summary. So a question or a part of this question, shouldn't we be fighting to repeal all anti-trade union or anti-strike laws as TC Congress voted for just today and again in 2019? Sarah Woolley, what is your perspective on this? I think realistically, the Tories aren't going to repeal any of the anti-trade union legislation that's there. So we could put a lot of resources into fighting that, but it's not going to change anything whilst ever they're in power. What we ought to be doing is putting our resources into looking at loopholes and in innovative ways around it, such as health and safety legislation and walking out under Section 44 and doing things like that. Because the likes of the Prison Officers Association can shut down whole prisons because it's not safe to work there and they legally can't go out on strike action, um, then we can all do better. So I get it, we don't want anti-trade union legislation in place at all, but we've got to remember not even the Labour Party um, turned that round when they were in power. So that's going to be a big challenge to, to defeat it. We've, I think we've just got to be more in innovative and learn from each other's wins and utilise them and be better at sharing good examples that do that. Thank you. A quick contribution from Eve and then a quick contribution from Shav. And then I'm going to move on to the next question. Thanks. Yeah, it is just a quick thing to add on. Um, I agree with everything that's been said. I also think a lot of young workers, when we're talking about people who don't really have any relationship to trade union, are beaten down by anti-union laws. Unions are, and I think it's really important to to be like telling them about that because the reason governments have invested so much time and energy into putting those laws in place is because they know how powerful um, collective action is. So I think that there's a real case for using that the really difficult like operating circumstances as a, in a kind of good comms way for young workers and saying look how scared they are of us that's why they're putting all this time and energy um, into this and there, there's a chapter in the book that's called um, your union isn't rubbish it's disempowered <laughs> because I think that is something that I heard a lot when I was writing this was people saying I would join my union but they don't really do anything um, and A, I'm sure in most cases that's not true but B, I think the perception comes from this context um, that's so difficult for unions to operate in and there's a real job to do in teaching people exactly why that is I think can be quite powerful in itself. Thank you. Shav? Yeah I was just going to say that in I totally agree yeah we should be fighting against the and uh, fight and try and repeal some of the legislation but in Wales we have got a slightly different position as far as the Trade Union Act of 2017 is concerned so if you are someone who works in the developed public sector then there are particular um, elements around particularly in relation to the ballot the 40 percent ballot threshold that doesn't apply any sort of monitoring of your facility time doesn't actually apply as well so there's no limit on that and also as far as the way that you have your end conditions around deductions of trade union subscriptions is also um, not neither is they've also included within the act that there's a specific provision that prohibits the devolved large public bodies from using agency workers to provide any cover during industrial action. And we, we thought that was really important because we knew that, particularly with the Tory government, there was always going to be the threat that we would eventually see that happen. So they are those things. And I think that there are some examples, for example, in, in Scotland and, and in Wales, where you've got governments who say, we want a fair work nation. We want, they are, uh, we want to be a living wage city, for example. You'll see all of these different uh, things being said. And so I think that there's an opportunity for us to play the political game as well and use those leveraging tactics but ultimately this is about building up the movement the more members that we have the more powerful that we are and I totally agree with what Brian was saying about naming and shaming because it does come to a point that so long as you have the evidence to back up your claim and there are people who are prepared to speak about their experiences and tell their stories from that personal perspective and you as the union are there ready to protect them as well and support them and not back away from it because it becomes too much. I think there is so much that we can do. I, I, I think that we shouldn't limit ourselves. And it goes back to that small C conservatism thing. It, it, it really does. And yeah, we should be explaining to younger workers, but also every worker, not we assume that just because someone's a member of a union, they understand 
what our limitations are when it comes to anti-union legislation. There's this real assumption. A lot of people still join the union for personal reasons. They don't necessarily join a union for the collective. And sometimes that conversation may never take place unless there is a big issue in that workplace at that given moment in time. Thank you. And we've had a comment which I think leads on really nicely from the point that you're making there about from someone who works in UCU and says that the issue for them is less about recruiting precarious young workers, although I know there's increasing precarity in that sector, but it's more at the minute about the next step, getting them more involved, having joined but that the learning curve can sometimes be really steep, that union structures can seem labyrinthine, the language can be very alien. And as you say, Shav, there's not that natural understanding of the constraints of the environment in which we're working. And so they're grateful to talk about union democracy and structures and also the need to demystify some of the acronyms that we use maybe. A question now for Sarah Jaffe on the quality or lack thereof of the reporting of an understanding of the Unite election, including or particularly by many um, on the left who may have refused to listen, what should be done? Yeah, so I'm in London right now. I've been in London for the summer. I'm back and forth a lot and I still don't know the intricacies of British trade union elections and I deleted so many tweets this summer and just like absolute, and I just start typing and be like, don't do it. Don't do it. You're not going to just get in a fight on Twitter about this. You're not. And for a variety of reasons, I didn't end up doing any reporting on it, which I now really regret because yeah, basically the Unite election was covered as if it was the second labor leadership as in the labor party. And that is not what it is. Unions are not the labor party. Unions are one part of the labor party and some of them are not in the labor party. That is itself a function of two things, right? One, you don't have very good labor journalism other than Eve. And two, that people have gotten into left-wing politics and socialist politics and class politics without having done it through workplace organizing in so many cases. And so it's still something that you think about as connected to electoral politics rather than connected to your workplace struggle and your everything. And after Sharon Graham won, there were a few articles in the New Statesman and elsewhere that were like, oh yeah, this shows the folly of covering a union election the way you cover political party election. And yet I see no attempts really to do any better by it. Eve did write a piece about it, right? For The Guardian. I think I tried to pitch one to somebody who said, no, we do those in house. And I was like, oh, that's funny. I haven't seen that you have a staff labor reporter. And this is, some of this is the same challenge that I was talking about. It's hard to convince sort of mainstream publications to invest in labor reporters. Although sometimes the financial times will do a great labor story. And as for the left, which should be doing better. One of the things I think we can do if we're talking about we as people within unions who want to see better labor coverage is to reach out and pitch those stories to Navara, to Tribune, to those people on the left who do have a platform who could cover labor stories and to say, hey, we've got this campaign going on, organizing hospitality workers at XYZ, and we would love it if somebody would come cover it. And building those relationships will actually help people start thinking of covering labor as labor and not labor as part of the labor, capital L, labor party. But yeah, the other thing is you just need labor reporters who actually make it their beat and actually cover it like it matters and not just, what does this say about the fate of continuity Corbynism or whatever? Thank you. We also had a comment from someone saying that union safety reps can play an interesting role in helping people see the tangible benefits of trade unionism. When you secure better lighting for staff to get to their cars at night, it's really understandable and easy to see the practical good the union does. And Unfortunately, that takes us to the end of our time. I feel like the conversation is only just getting started. We've heard about the need to be open with strategy, to be transparent, to be inclusive, to review our democracy and our structures, to work around anti-union laws or combat them, to demystify unions to members and non-members alike, and to reach out to people with a platform who could cover labour issues and get our messages to a wider audience. So thank you so much to our panel. Thank you very much to everyone who's come to listen. Thank you very much to everyone who asked a question. I'm sure you're all going to be dying now to get your hands on your own copy of Make Bosses Pay when it's released next week. So thank you so much and good night.